electricity, and magnetism. Hi right, folks, welcome to the next lecture on electromagnetism. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most fundamental properties of electricity, and that is the conservation of charge. Now, what do I mean when I say conservation of charge? Let's go ahead and put that down. Conservation, conservation of charge. Well, let me give you an example. Let's say we have a box of charges, okay? Now, I don't know how many charges are in this box. I don't know how many protons, electrons, cations, or anions in the box. All I know is that the box has a net charge, okay? So let's go ahead and put this box down. Okay, so here's my box of subatomic particles. And all I know is that this box has a net charge. It has a net charge of five coulombs. And as a matter of fact, I have this box right here. Here's my box, uh, straight from the department store, okay? And uh, it has a bunch of subatomic particles in it. If you roll it around, you can confirm that it has some protons, electrons in it, but I don't know how many of each particle it has. All I know that is that its uh, net charge is gonna be five coulombs. Now here's the question, here's the question. I'm gonna leave this box alone in the dark, in the basement uh, for one day, one week, one month, one year. And I'm gonna go on a vacation. Now when I come back from vacation, what's the net charge on my box gonna be? Well the answer is gonna be five coulombs. No matter how long I stay away on my vacation, the amount of charges in the box will never change as long as I keep my box an isolated system. In other words, as long as I make sure that no mass is able to exit or enter my box, my box will have the total amount of net charges conserved. So in 2016, its net charge is gonna be five coulombs. 2020, its net charge is gonna stay five coulombs. No matter how long I'm away on vacation, its net charge is gonna be five coulombs. Okay, so that's what the conservation of charge is all about. And we can formally state its definition as follows. Uh, let's go ahead and get an eraser, okay? So we can formally define this pretty easily. The algebraic sum, the algebraic sum of charges in an isolated system, that's an important word, isolated system remains conserved, remains conserved, okay. Okay, so that's what we mean when we say the conservation of charge. The total sum of all the charges in our system, in our isolated system, which allows no mass to enter or exit the box, is going to remain constant. Now, today I want to look at a very interesting property of, uh, of the conservation of charge, and that is, even though we cannot allow mass to enter our box or our system, we can allow something that doesn't have mass. What's something that doesn't have mass? But can create something that does have mass. Uh, let's ask the audience here. Let's let's poll the audience. Uh, audience, yeah. do we know something in the universe that has no mass but can create something with mass? Huh? Light. Wow. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, light is the answer. Light has no mass. It's a wave. And waves carry no mass, they only carry energy. And light is carried by particles called photons, right? So I've got a 100 milliwatt uh, uh, laser right here. It's actually classified as a weapon here in the US. But we're not going to be using it as a weapon. We're using this only as, uh, as an experimental device. So if I, if I take the cap off here, you're going to see the actual, uh, the actual circuit inside, inside this uh, laser over here. And uh, you can see that it's going to be pretty, pretty bright if I shine it in the, in the camera's general direction. And that's only the unfocused beam. The focused beam, of course, is much brighter and much uh, sharper to the eye. Now, why am, I, uh, why am I talking about lasers all of a sudden? Well, lasers, as, uh, as our audience just mentioned, or light waves, are something that have no mass, but as a matter of fact, they can create mass in our isolated system. And right now we're actually gonna check that out. So let's go ahead and check out how light waves 
can create particles with mass in an isolated system, even even by uh, <coughs> by conserving this fundamental law of conservation of charge. Okay, so uh, let's see let's see what we have. We have my box. Here's my box, and I'm gonna introduce a light wave. Okay, a light wave. Uh, since my laser is green. I'm gonna use this green marker to represent the f uh, the light wave right here. Okay, so that's gonna hit my box. Let's call it the photon, and uh, it's gonna hit my box. And what's what's it gonna make in my box? Well, let's check it out. Let's check it out. So I'm gonna go ahead and empty my box. Uh, if you shake my box, you're gonna hear all the subatomic particles inside. Let's go ahead and empty our box. Let's go ahead and pour everything out. And now. Now what we're going to do is I have an empty box, right? Empty box. And I'm going to shine, I'm going to shine my laser into my box. So let's see what happens. So here, here I'm going to shine my laser into my box. Okay, it's shining, it's shining. And that's it. I shone my laser into my box. Okay, now let's ask the audience. Audience I just shined a laser beam into my box. Is there anything new inside of my box? Do we see anything new? I shined a laser. Do we see anything new in the box? No. no. If you're looking at the macroscopic view. If you're looking at the microscopic view, you're going to see something new. What are the two new things you're going to see? Let's go ahead and take blue. What are the two new things you're going to see? You're going to see, you're going to see an electron. Okay. Okay. So if I see an electron, what else do I have to see? Uh, do, does the audience know? Proton. Proton would be the answer if we wanted to conserve our charge, but nature creates particles like the electron with their antiparticle. What's the antiparticle of the electron? The positron. Okay, so what's going to happen is I shine my, la my uh, laser beam onto my box and there's an electron and a positron created. An electron and a positron created inside my box. Too small to see with the naked eye, but it is there. Believe it or not. And uh, now what we're actually going to do, now what we're going to do is find the wavelength, the wavelength, the wavelength of light. Let's pick up a dark green marker. We're going to find the wavelength of light required, required to produce uh, an electron and, uh, and a positron. So what is this called again? This is called a light wave. Okay. Uh, so now, what are some of the formulas we need to use to find the wavelength of light required? Okay. We want to find the wavelength of this light wave that just created this electron and positron. So how do I find the wavelength? Uh, does the audience know any formulas for wavelength of a, of a light wave? Lambda. Do okay. Uh, the velocity is lambda times frequency. Yes. Yes. Or as I like to say, it, distance is rate times time. Distance is a rate times time, right? So what is our distance here? What is our distance? My distance is gonna be lambda or the wavelength function. What is my rate? Well, of course, this is an electromagnetic wave. So my rate is gonna be the speed of light or C. What is my time? My time is gonna be, free, uh, sorry, period. Okay, time is period. They're analogous. And now if I solve for my period right here, I'm gonna get my wavelength over the speed of light. And since period, period is gonna be the reciprocal of frequency, we can go ahead and say that the frequency is gonna be the speed of light over my wavelength, the speed of light over my wavelength. Okay, that's good, that's good. Now, if I go ahead and multiply my frequency by Planck's constant, what am I gonna get? Anyone know what I'm gonna get if I uh, multiply my frequency by a small constant. I'm gonna get E. What is E? Ladies and gentlemen, tell me what E is. What does E stand for? E for mc squared. That's right. E equals mc squared. And we're actually gonna use that uh, to go ahead and deduce what uh, the wavelength of our wave has to be. So let's go ahead and write that down. E equals mc squared. Okay, and we wanna find the amount of wavelength uh, of a light wave that we need to produce an electron and a positron. So let's go ahead and plug that into E equals mc squared. Ladies and gentlemen, what's the mass of an electron? Do we know? 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31. Okay, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And the speed of light is 
3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. So anyone in the audience feel comfortable uh, calculating what this is going to be? We're going to have 9.11 times 3 times, oh sorry, not 3, 3 squared rather, which is 9. And so we're going to have 10 to the minus 31 plus 16. Okay, audience, uh, anyone want to calculate this? Uh, yes, yes, uh, Professor Shabona Isaac Berry, yes. Please calculate 9.11 times 9. Please tell me what that's going to be. Wrong. It's actually going to be 8.2. Okay, times times what? What is it minus? Be 9.11 times 9. All right, sure. And what's minus 31 plus 16? Minus 31 plus 16 is equal to 15. Or as I like to call it, 14. All right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so the total energy required to produce an electron is going to be 8.2 times 10 to the 14. What, uh, Professor Sabrina Isaac Berry? Tell me what unit we need to express our energy in. That's Jules, right. Jules. Jules. Who was, uh, what was the unit Jules named after? Uh, Charles Jules. Charles Jules. What year was he born? And what year did I he have die? I no idea. That's unfortunate. Let's search that up. As well as what country he lived. Okay, so that's the energy required to produce one of these electrons. Now, let's go ahead and plug that in over here and we can go ahead and deduce what f uh, frequency and wavelength our electron needs to be. So plug in 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 uh, joules into our energy and Planck's constant times our frequency. So our f the frequency of our wavelength is going to be 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34. Uh, does anyone know what Planck's constant is? Uh, is it 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34? Yeah, negative 34. Okay, minus 34. So, who in the audience wants to calculate this? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Thank you, Professor Sabrina Isaac Barry. Please calculate 8.2 over 6.6. .6. Let me know what you get. 8.2 over 6.6. .6. Hello? Uh, hello? 8.2 over 6.6. .6. Uh, do we know what 8.2 over 6.6 .6 is? Uh, anyone? 8 .2. Anyone? Over 6.6? .6? Yeah. 1.2. 1 oh, 1.2. 1 thank you, thank you. Times 10 to the minus 14 plus 34. So that's going to give me what? 34 minus 14 is going to give me 20. Okay, 20. That's going to be the frequency. Uh, that's going to be the frequency. 1.2 times 10 to the 20. Okay, that's pretty good. But I want the wavelength. How do I get the wavelength? Well, now I can just plug it into this this guy over here. Right? Frequency is uh, the speed of light over the wavelength. So let me go ahead and put that down here. So my wavelength is going to be the speed of light over my frequency. And of course, what's the speed of light? The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. What's my frequency? Well, we just found out my frequency is 1.2 times 10 to the 20. So, um, Anyone in the audience know what 3 over 1.2 is? <coughs> 3 over 1.2? Anyone uh, want to volunteer? Oh, yes, yes. Saborno, yes. Uh, 3 over 1.2. 3 yeah. over 1.2, mm -hmm. please. Yes, yes. 3 over 1.2. 2.5. 2 2.5, thank you. So 2.5 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. That's going to be the wavelength of our light. Now, looking at your physics reference table, what type of electromagnetic wave is this? Is it a radio wave, an infrared wave, uh, a microwave wave, a microwave, oh god, a visible wave? Is it a gamma ray wave? Uh, anyone want to kind of guess what kind of wave we have here? 10 to the minus 12 meters should give you a hint. It's a gamma ray, it's a gamma ray. What does that mean? That means if I were to get my laser, if I were to get my laser, I would never have been able to produce an electron and a positron with this kind of, with this kind of uh, crappy machinery. I would need a gamma ray. And as a matter of fact, the universe has these uh, in the form of gamma ray bursts. And you can imagine that a lot of these matter and antimatter uh, pair production processes occur near gamma rays. Now, when you have a light wave like a photon, uh, like a gamma ray creating uh, a particle like the electron and an antiparticle like the positron. This is called a pair production process. So let's go ahead and write that down. 
it's called a pair a pair production process and at some point at some point these two guys these two guys are gonna come back together they're gonna come back together they're gonna at some point come back together and annihilate each other in a burst of light and return them back to the photon and of course we like to call that annihilation annihilation all right ladies and gentlemen and that's it for uh, this lecture on, on uh, electromagnetism and uh, we'll check you out next time <laughs>